Hello, everybody. So good to have you back here on the Astro Imaging Channel this Sunday night at 9.30 Eastern. Like every Sunday night, 9.30 Eastern. Uh, tonight's family night. We're going to have some family coming in here to do stuff. Uh, the family includes all the TAIC members. They were invited to send in their favorite shots of the of, uh, solar system objects over the last Oh, actually, we didn't have a this apparition rule this time, so they could send in whatever they wanted whenever they took their picture. And we got some good ones, and we'll be showing them at the first part of the show. We were going to have two other things coming on, and one of them, one of our family members is a little sick, so he couldn't be here. Tim's not going to be able to be here today. He's not sick, but he's had a family thing. So um, we're not going to be able to see him tell us about the uh, uh, packages in uh, uh, PixInsight and image containers and things like that. But he's still part of us and we'll get we'll get him to do that uh, program at some point in the near future. We are going to have Eric come and uh, he's going to be telling us some cool stuff about processing in um, Photoshop. Let me start my screen sharing now so you can see what's happening here. Boink, boink. And uh, over to the calendar. Um, uh, Tim, Eric's going to be digging out the detail using high pass filters. And because uh, Tim's not going to be here, Eric's going to go a little dip deeper into the hole that he's digging for himself. So he'll be back a little bit later to tell us about that. Uh, Roland's going to be here next week. Roland's here every day. Roland is one of those people that I'm constantly quoting because he is real intelligent and he does really hard work and explains things really well. Uh, he did a really good show for us a while back about how to, uh, about all the different uh, image acquisition programs. And I like to refer people to that when they're trying to choose between Nina and SGP and Voyager and everything else. And next week, he's coming back to tell us about Voyager imaging software. And then we got Brandon and Jose coming. And then we are not gonna be here on May 22nd the weekend before Memorial Day. Uh, we're not going to be here because we're all going to be up at, um, um, at the Advanced Imaging Conference in San Jose. And we remind you, if you haven't yet registered for that, do to go. We've got four or five of our, of our local family members. Wanda will be here and Rory will be there and um, Eric will be there. Tim will be there. I'll be there. We'll all be there. We'd love to have you come up and say hi to us and, and you know, you know, of course, what I want is to have you contact us so that you can present on the Astro Imaging channel. Uh, just hit the contact button, or if you're at AIC, just come on up and say, hey, I want to give a show and impress us that you know what you're talking about, kind of, and we'll sign you up to put on a show. Or if you not can't make it to AIC, hit the contact button there on the website, come, tell us your name, and sign up. Um, Tonight, though, we are going to be doing one of our programs that we do occasionally. This is TAIC Workshop. It's one of the programs we do occasionally. And we have decided on, uh, no, we haven't decided. We've decided to do another one of these, but we haven't decided on whose, soft, or whose uh, data we're going to use. We need a good set of data so that all you guys can go out there and process it and come back and uh, show us how you processed it. That's one of the things we do. The other thing we do is TAIC shots. And uh, actually, um, this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And we are going to do this again in uh, after the summer. And you know what happens during the summer, don't you? During the summer, the Milky Way comes around. And we're going to, our theme for the next TAIC shots is going to be the heart of the Milky Way. So you got to talk about, you know, um, Ophiuchus, the bottom part of Ophiuchus, and Sagittarius, and maybe a little bit of Scorpius and uh, Scutum, the star cloud, Scutum, all that kind of stuff. That area, page 22 of uh, the Deep Sky Atlas, although you guys wouldn't know about the Deep Sky Atlas because you're all imagers and none of you were visual people. But anyway, page 22 is my favorite page of uh, the Sky Atlas 2000. That's what I, Sky Atlas 2000. At any rate, why don't I quit babbling here and uh, turn it over to Molly. Molly, 
It's your turn. Show us what uh, Arno has come up with. Arno takes all these shots and he puts them together and he puts them into TAIC shots, makes a little movie for us. And Molly's about to show it to us, I hope. Oh, I got to stop presenting. There we go. Yep. Um, all right. This should run momentarily. All right. Let's see.
We're back. Alex. Alex. Somebody wake up, Alex. I'm awake. <laughs> I, I was dreaming. I was dreaming of someday taking images like that. Actually, I was. I'm on the time delay over there. So, uh, um, okay, where am I? I got to turn my sound off on the YouTube. Um, and I want to thank Arno for putting all that together. I want to thank all the people who made TAIC shots special by putting uh, by by submitting their. Um, <laughs> Okay, I got a problem here because I'm watching the YouTube and and that's on a 30 second delay. So Molly's like waving at me right now trying to anyway, <laughs> back to watching the meeting. Eric, would you like to put an end to my silliness by telling us? No, no, I was enjoying about, it actually. About some gonna, hot pass filtering. I was going to add a comment. The, but, yes, uh, go ahead. Do what you need. Uh, no, I was going to ask add a comment about your silliness, but I think we'll pass on that. Okay. All right. So, uh, what what should I do? Should I start sharing my screen, or can I make? Want to make a few comments before I get going? Let's see. Sharing screen. Mm, there is a little guy. Share your entire screen. Okay. Now we. Bring up Photoshop. All right, are you going to? I don't see what's on uh, YouTube. Are you going to put my face in the corner? It, yes, I've got your you face. You don't in really the have to, but if you want to, uh, put it in the lower corner so it's not in front of the menus. Yeah, sure. Okay. So we're going to go through a process to bring out the details in an image. Now, there are probably a, a, a hundred different ways that you could do this. And as I saw a very senior person at AIC uh, present one time, he said, this is my way of doing it. It is not the only way, but it's a way that I learned by starting out with narrow band images and how to bring out the detail and all that nebulosity. And probably narrow band images is the most, but not the only place you might use something like this. So why don't we let, let's get started. So I have in front of me the initial image of the Rosette Nebula uh, in hydrogen alpha. And I think anyone that's looking at this will say, well, you know, that's a pretty good image. Why would you ever want to try to get more detail out of it? And I think the answer is, there's always more detail to get out of your images. And we want to get as much detail as we can, but not cross over that fuzzy little line where you say, well, you know, you're really, this isn't detail. You're just creating it. It's not really in the image. I don't know really where that line is, and I've never really found it. But you will get to the point where if you start adding too much detail, the image just visually looks bad. So we don't want to go there. But let's get started on uh, this particular image, hydrogen alpha for the rosette. And we're going to do something called high pass filtering. So high pass filtering, let me bring up the next image we're going to use, which is the starless image. What's a high pass filter? A high pass filter in electronics is something that clips the signal so you only get that portion of the signal that you're really interested in. And a high pass filter in Photoshop is really some of the same thing. And let me turn off these other layers and just leave the narrow band layer. So this is the starless narrow band uh, uh, rosette, which I created, I think, with Starnet, although you could do it with, with uh, Star Exterminator or you could do it manually in Photoshop. There's lots of ways to create the starless image. So this is my starless image of the rosette. And underneath filter, you may not be able to read this. There's a drop down menu. And underneath other, there is high pass filter. Now, look over at the histogram on the right. So I'm going to change the radius. If you can't see it, I'm going to set it at one pixel. So you can see from the histogram of the right that I'm clipping 
the histogram. So I'm only showing a small portion of this image and the rest of it is really 50% gray. So the clip occurs right in the middle of the histogram. So basically the whole image is gray, except for a small amount of it, which shows contrast, where you have a change in this part of the histogram from light to dark or from gray, actually from gray to light or from gray to dark. So I'm gonna cancel out of that. So now we have our starless image and there's, there's some, some things that we can do with the starless image to give it more detail. And again, let me just zoom in on this. There's plenty of detail in this image. Let me zoom in on something I call the wrench, one of my favorite structures. And the way I really analyzed whether this, you know, I got enough detail. We can see some Bach globules over here. The rosette's a wonderful image, but I think I can get more detail out of the starless image. And the more detail I get out of the starless image, the more detail I'll put into the, to the rosette with stars. So I have another tab here. That looks like the same image, doesn't it? And of course it is. But there's a filter which I'm kind of getting the hang of from Topaz. And again, I'm not really recommending it, but it does do some interesting things. And it is called filter from Topaz Lab called Sharpen AI, in which they claim to use AI to get more detail. And I've been experimenting with this for a while. And if it comes up, it's going to take a while to, to load up. And you can see the little progress bar in the bottom. And eventually, it's going to come up with, its, with the kind of more detail that it might get out of the starless image. And there we have it. And you can see that it looks like you are getting a little more detail just by using this particular add-on from Topaz. Now, again, I'm not really recommending it, but it does some interesting things. And the more detail I get out of the starless image, the more detail eventually I'm going to put back into the rosette. Now, I'm going to cancel out of that because if I actually implement this particular filter, it's going to take two or three minutes. And unless I play music, there's really nothing to do in those two or three minutes. But you do see in this filter that it has a slider here and various presets and you can determine how much detail you want to put in. I can tell you on this particular filter, it's just real easy to kind of go way over the line and get way too much detail. So you kind of have to play with it if, if you're interested. And I think they have a 30 day trial for this. So I'm going to cancel out of that. Close without sharing. Now I have run the Topaz Sharpen AI. And it is this layer right here, which I'm going to turn on. And from the full screen, you can't really see that there's much difference. But if I take the magnifying glass and I zoom in in these areas, let me zoom way in, and I click this sharpen layer off and on, you can see that it does sharpen it. And I do have a little more detail. And that's what I want. And it's this sharpened AI layer that I'm going to use in the high pass filter. So let's go back to the full screen and go over. There's my original image. And this layer here is the sharpened AI layer that I had. I'm going to use, well, uh, let's see, Starless. So now we're back to our original image. Now, let me show you why you don't use a regular image with a high pass filter that has stars in it, because it produces a bunch of artifacts. So I'm going to take this layer, I'm going to duplicate it, and I'm going to go into filters, other, high pass, and you can see what's happening already 
all these little stars have nice little halos around it. And if I now apply it, I'm really jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm going to apply it like I would normally do, which is overlay. I'll explain that a little bit. And you can now see that I have a bunch of halos around my stars, which I don't want. And the stars have gotten bigger too. More detail has come out, but I don't want stars with high pass filters. So let's get rid of that layer. Go back to the full screen. And now I'm going to take the starless layer, which has been enhanced with the, the topaz. Actually, it's this layer right here. And I'm going to make three additional copies of it. So I'm going to drag it down here and make a copy. Make two more copies. So now I have four starless layers, which I'm going to put into a folder. Open the folder up. And let's take the first starless layer. And let me zoom right in on a structure where we can see what's going on. OK, so we take this starless layer. I'm going to go into the high pass filter, filters, others, high pass. And I'm going to set my width, my radius, that is how it's clipping that histogram. I'm going to start out at the lowest layer, lowest number that actually shows something, let's say one pixel. And I can see, if I can you see that right here, that there's some contrast. It's mostly gray, but there is some contrast here. So my high pass filter has accentuated the transition from gray to lighter and from gray to darker. So now we have a high pass filter at one pixel, which I'm going to overlay. That is, I'm going to blend it to the layer below. And there is a blend mode called overlay. And when I overlay it, so how does an overlay layer work? It's kind of interesting. So basically, if it were 100% gray, it would do nothing. But if it's a little bit darker or a little bit lighter, it's going to make the image below it a little bit lighter and a little bit darker. So those little structures that we created with the high pass filter are going to bring more contrast without otherwise affecting image below it. So if I zoom all the way in, that's probably a little too far in. And I turn that layer off. Oh, that's kind of like magic. So it it looks like I'm bringing that layer more into focus without affecting the stars because I'm working with a starless image. That is, I've made a high pass filter, in this case, only one pixel wide, which shows structures that are very, very small. I've overlaid it using a blend mode called overlay. And so anything that's not 50% gray is going to either lighten it if it's lighter than 50% gray or darken it if it's darker than 50% gray. So if there's a question about using the overlay, now would be a good time to ask it. If it's not, we'll move on to the next. So now we have another hey, hang, hang, oh. hang on there, Eric. Okay. I, just want, I just wanted to remind people that um, um, one of the things that makes Astro Imaging Channel different than all the other YouTube channels out there is you can ask your questions live. And most of you know how to do that. Uh, you're watching along and there's a big comment section should be next to your screen. And you can just type in what you want Eric to tell you. Uh, if you have some different question or he hasn't covered something or he needs to expand on something, please um, just go on over there and and uh, ask Eric to, to ask Eric a question. OK. Thanks, Eric. OK. So I have a series of layers here. And so the idea is to make the most out of the high pass filter, we're going to make larger and larger cuts of that histogram from maybe one pixel to two to four to six to eight. There's no specific sequence 
that you go through. It just depends on the quality and the detail of your data. So what I'm doing for this particular sequence of layers is not necessarily what you're doing, it depends on your data. And you can do this for galaxies as well, which you use a different amount of pixels. So we're gonna turn on another starless layer and we're gonna go to the filter other high path. And instead of one pixel, I'm gonna go to two pixels. Again, this is just kind of a guess sequence. I'm not totally guessing because I was doing this before in preparation for this discussion. And once again, we're going to use the blend mode of overlay, which means anything that's lighter than 50% is gonna lighten the image. Anything that's darker than 50% is gonna darken the image. And now once again, let me turn off the high pass filter. Wow, that looks a lot sharper. And if I were to go around the image, I think there's some nice Bach globules here. So look at this structure. I mean, I think this is real detail. I don't think I've done anything extraordinary. The Bach globules are a lot sharper. This nebula, this dark structure over here is a lot sharper. But let me go back to the wrench because Oh, let me see, where is the wrench? Where is the wrench? My favorite structure. Oh, there's the wrench. Actually, we got two wrenches. So now let's get our third layer. Same kind of thing, except now we're gonna go into the high pass filter, filter other high pass, and let's try four pixels, which means if you see with the histogram, we're cutting it a little bit wider. We're getting, we're, outlining larger structures that have a transition from light to dark or dark to light. We're gonna say, okay. And we're now gonna go in and overlay it. And now we're gonna turn off the high pass filter and turn it back on. Now you can easily go too far with this. Pretty soon that your image can look kind of harsh. Now we're zoomed in a lot, so that's probably why it's just getting a little too harsh and I'm not liking it. So I can easily go in and say, well, you know, this high pass filter, I think this dark to light is getting a little bit too much. So I'm gonna turn the opacity down to let's say 60%. That's how much it's applied. And you can see the result. It's giving a little more contrast. So now let me zoom out. Turn off. Probably can't see it, especially on YouTube where the resolution isn't quite what I have on my screen. But we have another layer here. I'm gonna make a copy of it so I can go one more layer deep. Turn this on. Go to filters, others, high pass. And now let's go to uh, scientific wild ass guess, eight pixels. And the larger a number, the wider will be the cut on the histogram. And the larger the structure that it will apply contrast to it. When I change the application of that layer to overlay. And now if I turn this on and off, you can easily see that you get a lot of detail in this nebulosity. It's literally like turning the focus ring on a camera. And even though there was nothing wrong with the original image, I now have an image that has more detail, more contrast, and to me is more interesting. We have one more layer here. So what we're gonna do on this layer is we're gonna go completely overboard and show you what can go wrong with using high pass filters. Filter, other, high pass. So now let's go to something a little crazy like 32 pixels. Oh my gosh, look at that. And we're going to apply that. 
Yeah, uh, and now your image is getting to look a little funky and I wouldn't do it. But the interesting thing, when you wanna look at very large structures, and let me turn this layer on and off, it is adding a little contrast and maybe I want just a small amount of this very large cut of the high pass filter. So instead of applying it 100%, I'm going to apply it, I just want a large contrast on big structures. I'm gonna apply it 20%. And that's a subtle difference, but giving me slightly more contrast. By the way, look at the histogram. The histogram is very telling because as you apply these high cast filters, you actually broaden the histogram. That is, you have more of the lighter colors and more of the darker colors. And this is my finished image. I'll tell you again that the, the sequence of uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, and 32 is, is this something that kind of I look at the image and I see what should be applied and I apply it. Every image that you work with is going to be different. I can also tell you that this works best for hydrogen alpha images. And I would say there's a good many of the people on the program tonight and where most of us have started where we're in light polluted skies. So hydrogen alpha images of nebulosity is something that, that probably a good many of us started with. So this is a way to get your hydrogen alpha images using starless images and high pass filtering, applying them as overlay to get more detail out of your image. Uh, this well, might be a good place to kind of stop. We, any we do have questions. a couple of questions here. Sure. Uh, Hema CP Mova. Is there a general rule of thumb on when high pass filtering is better suited over wavelet or unsharp mask sharpening? Well, unsharp mask, I've had, I kind of start out with unsharp sharp mask, but it, it is a more heavy handed tool than this. And basically wavelets are perfectly legitimate if you're more comfortable with wavelets. I think the high pass filter gives you a little bit more control, but if you're an expert and want to stick with Pix Insight, then wavelets will work perfectly well. Whether they give a better image than this, I personally don't think so, but there's certainly, it's a legitimate way to bring more contrast to your image. Okay. Uh, Another the question? That, that's the questions for now. There have been a few comments and things like that, but uh, it's your turn. Okay. Now, this is not only good for hydrogen alpha. Let's go over here. This is an image I'm working on now. This is Messier uh, 63. And I can tell you that there's not as much detail because there's really not a lot of nebulosity that you can determine in these uh, galaxies. By the way, this was taken out at the SRO. I'm still working on this image. This is the luminosity image and it's about 10 to 15 hours worth of data so far. But you can see that the, the galaxy itself, you know, it, you know it has detail in there, but you can't really get at it. So can high pass filtering really do the job for you? And I would say that the answer is yes. So let's demonstrate it. So if we're gonna do high pass filtering, we're really not interested in the whole image here. We're only interested in that portion of the galaxy where we know there's more contrast, there's nebulosity, there's all sorts of things going on. So the first thing I would do is I would clip the image to show really the galaxy itself. And you see that part of the galaxy could really do with more, more contrast, but there are a bunch of stars in here. So the first thing I'd have to do is create the starless image, just like I did with the hydrogen alpha image. So the next layer, is my basic starless image. Well, there might be some stars in here, but nothing that's really gonna interfere with our, 
are trying to get more contrast and using high pass filter. The other thing that you notice here is there's a lot of noise here and I don't want to enhance the noise. And if I took the whole image and made a high pass filter out of it, I would, I would bring up this noise, I would accentuate it because these are small structures and they would get more contrast just like the nebulosity. So the first thing I would normally do is, I don't want to use this whole image. I just want to get in there here. So I'm going to make a selection. So here I'm selecting the galaxy. Now, you notice my selection is kind of ragged, partially because I'm using a mouse, my hand trembles a little bit, but there's an advantage to, <laughs> to having an irregular selection in Photoshop. If your selection is perfect, like you use a circle or an ellipse or try to make it very smooth, you will be able to see the lines between your selected image and your unselected image. And any operation you do on that selection, if it's very regular, like a circle, you can easily see in the image and you don't wanna do that. The other thing that I do on this kind of selection is I will feather the selection. So under the selection menu, I will modify it and I will feather that selection. Now, how much do you feather the selection? You kind of look at the size of the image and how many pixels across this particular part of the galaxy is. And again, scientific wild ass guess, I'm gonna make the selection 50 pixels. So now I have a very soft transition between the selected image and the non-selected image. In fact, I'm gonna do this again because I don't really like this selection because I went right over to the edge and when I feather it in, yeah, let's do it this way, not to the edge. Now we're gonna make selection, modify, feather, 50 pixels. And I'm going to copy this selection and paste it. And I'm going to do this three more times. I'm going to turn off the starless image. I'm going to take my starless images here, put them into a folder, just like before. Open up the folder and turn off and by now, you know what's gonna happen next. I'm gonna go through a series of high pass filters to try to add more contrast to this galaxy. So let's go in, filter, other, high pass. Now I'm not gonna start out with 32, that's kind of harsh. Let's, and if I go to, we'll say one like I did before, it's gonna be nothing but gray. And that's because the resolution of this galaxy is not as fine as a hydrogen alpha image for a nebula. So I'm gonna to have to start out with a higher number. Let's try two. Yeah, I don't know if I'm seeing any structure, Well, let's go with two. And we're going to apply that. That is, we're going to use the blend mode of overlay just like before. Where anything that is less than 50% gray is going to lighten. Everything that's more than 50% gray is going to darken. You already know this. I'm going to zoom in to see whether I, did I add any contrast to this? Let's turn it off. Nah, not much. So let's turn it on and let's go to another layer. Filter, other, bypass. And let's go to four pixels. Ah, now I'm seeing some lightening and darkening area. I'm gonna overlay this as before. And now you can see I've added some contrast without really affecting any of the stars. So let's zoom out. and go to selection, oh, filter, other, high pass, and let's go to six pixels. 
and overlay it. And now I've really brought some a lot more detail into it. But I've also done something else. Since the galaxy photos are inherently noisier, that if you zoom in on here, you see I've accentuated the noise, which is not a good thing. But there's a simple solution to that, which still brings out the contrast that you're adding, get that accentuation of noise. So the first filter, I don't think there's much noise. The second one, yeah, we're starting to see a noise. A simple way around this is simply go into the filter to the Gaussian blur. And I'm going to set that at two pixels. Now the noise is really going away. And I'll go to the third layer, filter, Gaussian blur. <coughs> Excuse me. We still have the contrast, but we haven't accentuated the noise. And now what I'm going to do is, let's see. So now I can take this particular image and I can feather it into here and give more contrast to the image. And let's see if I have, if I'm set up to do that. Tone mapping. Yeah, we're going to do something called a stamp. Which is summing all the, the visible. So now we have a copy of all the the changes that we made to this galaxy. And if I mark all of this and copy it, I can now bring it back. Whoop, not to that one. Let's bring it back to that one. And I can paste it in. Now I got to tell you, this is not a finished image, and you can see it doesn't really fit in there perfectly. So let's just. Do a quick adjustment with the levels. Uh, I'm going to go down and align it with the image here. Just give me a moment to catch up. Uh, where are the stars to align? Where are you suckers? Oh, there we are. So now we have So the other thing I would do is feather this in so we don't have these nice square little rectangle. Select inverse, feather the selection. Now let's do 50 again and delete it. And now we've brought in more detail. Doesn't look like that's perfectly aligned yet, does it? Oh, I can fix that. So now we have more detail in our galaxy. Now, once again, this is not a finished image. There's a lot of processing left to do, but the galaxy has a lot more detail, and we did the same kind of operation but using high pass filters with the galaxy as we did with the nebula. Uh, are there any questions? 
Yeah, we got uh, we got one sitting out there. Let me get back over to that page. Uh, Martin asks, um, and this was back towards when you were finishing the rosette. Um, he asked this: Do you bring your hydrogen alpha back to Pix Insight to stack it with the other uh, filters, or what do you do? Okay, all the pre-processing work is done in, in Pix Insight. All the okay. calibration, the alignment, stacking. Uh, the initial stretching, everything is done in PixInsight. So the image that I bring over is really the starting image that you saw. So if I turn over, turn off this, this is the image, I just turned off all the high pass filter. This is the image that comes over from PixInsight. I may do a little work with it using maybe some of the camera raw filters in Photoshop, but all up to about 50% of completion is all done initially in PixInsight. Uh, not in Photoshop. Photoshop is is all the, the finish work. And I know there are a lot of people that will you know do picks insight right to the bitter end, and I have no objection to that. But uh, having 30 years experience with Photoshop and the subtlety for which you can make selections and operate on an image, uh, I just I personally cannot duplicate with picks insight. On the other hand, you can't do a lot of things with Photoshop that you can obviously do with PixInsight. Do you do your, um, do you combine your hydrogen alpha with other channels in Photoshop then? You mean for the Hubble palette? That's absolutely done. And yeah, that's a whole nother. I think I've demonstrated that before mm -hmm. uh, with yeah, the think, multi, multi level uh, histogram balancing. I think he's asking if you, if you do these edits in Photoshop and then bring it back to PixInsight for combining with other channels or whether you do the subsequent channel combination and other work also in Photoshop? Not quite sure the, of the question. In other words, if this image that you see with the high pass filter, this is a finished image. Oh, so, so you're like, you're just gonna publish the hydrogen alpha and not combine it with color? No, that would come later. So probably, uh, and I've done this before, uh, so I would have three images. I would have the hydrogen alpha, the sulfur, and the oxygen. And I would treat each of them kind of the way that you see the, the hydrogen alpha. And for something like the rosette, there's plenty of data in all three channels. So I would probably take all of them, uh, create starless images. Those are the ones that go over to make the, the tone map, and then probably use this image as the luminosity for the Hubble palette image. There's there's two questions in Martin's question. Um, one is, do you then, after you've got this wonderful hydrogen alpha image, do you then develop the S2 and O3 or whatever else you're going to do with it and combine them? And your answer is, yeah, you yes. then combine them. Then he throws in the word picks insight there, which is a whole nother question. And you're answering I do it uh, with the tone mapping techniques you've shown us before, I think, in Photoshop. You don't take it back over to PixInsight to do it. No, again, I just don't think you have the subtle control. Okay. And, and I've developed a technique, which is the multi-level tone mapping, which I don't think there are tools in PixInsight to do right. that kind of thing, because it requires uh, selections. So, so Martin's got... And saying the word "picks insight" there, he made it. He may have made it into a different question than, than what we were imagining. But the point is, yes, you do take that hydrogen alpha and combine it back, uh, but you don't do it in "picks insight." You do it in Photoshop because that's what Photoshop. you're familiar with, and it's got more power for you. Okay, and, there's some other. Oh, and this particular data set, the uh, the final Hubble palette image. And I also collected data for RGB. So there was an RGB version of this as well as a Hubble palette. Uh, that was submitted as an APOD and it got an APOD, I think uh, two years ago. And it was under the title of Roses Aren't Always Red, if you want to look that up. And it was a rollover. So when you roll it over, I think it starts out with the Hubble palette or maybe the other way around. When you roll over, it turns into the the RGB. And actually the RGB is an HO RGB where you combine, you give a little highlighting of the RGB with the red hydrogen alpha and the blue green oxygen. So th this is a data set that I, I 
really fit nicely into the Riccardi Hondas when I had it. And uh, I just, it's a pleasure to work on. Okay. Norm wants to know, when you hit OK on the high pass filter, does it automatically apply it to your image? Well, what what happens is, let me just highlight one of the high pass filters. So here's a starless. Oh, uh, actually, yeah, let's turn this one on. So right now, this is called blend mode, this little drop down menu over here. And normal blend mode is just, it's, right on top of it. I'll change this to 100%. So this is normally how it would look. It's just laying on top of the layer below, but there are a variety of blend modes. And the overlay blend mode is, as I've described, just allows changes in contrast because the whole image is, as you see, it's gray except for these structures in the nebulosity, which are either slightly darker or slightly lighter. And again, this is probably a harsh one to really demonstrate. So let's turn this one down. Actually, why don't I just turn it off? So I'll turn this over to normal. And you can see basically that's like 98% gray. It's only those changes in contrast, which are translated to the image below it, when I select overlay as what's known as the blending mode. So Norm, I think the answer is that it's the, it's the blending mode that allows the new filter to be applied to what was below it. Yeah, let me just, here, let me, there's a little, I sometimes experiment with blending modes. I can just click through the blending modes. There's all sorts of blending modes would produce all sorts of effect, most of which are pretty gnarly. But they all have different functions. So let's go back to the overlay. There's actually other blending modes here, which all have the same effect of either lightening or darkening. But the overlay mode has the effect of both lightening and darkening image, which we interpret visually is being contrast. OK, let's go back to the next question. Um, Norm clarified, do you have to flatten the image to set all the layers together? Yes. And if if you want to have a final image, so I have a bunch of layers here. And that's the way Photoshop works. That's whatever yeah. you're doing in Photoshop, that's going to be true. So I and, have something called a, uh, called a stamp. Let me just see over here on the left is a little application, which means combined all visible, visible. And if I play that action, I have now created a combination of all the visible layers. And that's in this layer here. So if I turn everything off, I still have the image. OK. There's, there's all sorts of cute things here that. You know more about Photoshop than I do. <laughs> anyway. uh, I've wasted a lot of uh, brain cells on that for sure. Um, David Bingham has a, uh, has a question. Uh, where you, you started with starless images. How do you eliminate your tiniest stars? Morphological transformation is not doing a great job for, for him. Um, what, how, what, what tips do you have for eliminating the small stars? Hmm. That's that's an interesting question. So with a hydrogen alpha image, uh, either Starnet or uh, Star Exterminator will just about eliminate all of your your stars completely. However, uh, let me just demonstrate. So this is my stamp. This is everything. So if I have a star residue, now this, if there's a residue, the little circle that doesn't get in there, I will generally go through the entire image. And if there's a residue in there, I'll go, oh, don't want that there. And there is a function over here called, uh, where is that little guy? Hailing brush. Oh, here it is. 
This is called the spot healing brush. And it samples the layers down below. I'll make it small. So if I had a if I had a star residue and I wanted to get rid of it, I just and it goes away. And it's it's a cute little function because it looks at the background and then interpolates what the background should be. And I've just eliminated a star. Obviously, it's if you have a like a thousand stars, you can't eliminate it in the image. Let me just back up. Okay. The uh, healing brush, click, it's gone, and it fills it in with what it thinks it should be. Okay. Uh, there's say. there's other ways to do it. There is something. Let's see. There's a function. What's the name of that function? I've style. What is other? I have forgotten how I used to do that. Let's see. Give me a moment. Maybe I can catch up on this. Can you imagine what's going oh. through this man's head right now? Going through files and files, drawers, and all his brains opening the cabinets and so, shutting the so cabinets. So there's. So let's let's just make a a copy here. I'm gonna make a copy. Here's something called dust and scratches, and I used to generate starless images using dust and scratches. So if you have some residues of stars, and if you're in Photoshop, uh, where is dust and scratches generate? I forgot where it is. Dust. It's under noise. There it is. There it is. There's old good old dust and scratches. And therefore, by controlling this slider here, you can eliminate stars. Uh, well, I guess I've eliminated more than stars, where right? it's the not so aggressive. So by controlled use of dust and scratches, you can eliminate stars. This is the way we used to do it like several years ago before some nice things like Starnet came out. Now I'm not gonna implement this because this would be a mess. But I would say if you have uh, a few star residues and using Photoshop and you wanna get rid of those residues, you could even use the, you know, the, the magic brush here or you can use dust and scratches and they will go away. If, they, if you don't eliminate them and you have little halos, it'll cause halos around your final image. So all the stars will have halos and that would be a bad thing. You don't wanna do that. Uh, Eric, Shantasek or Nori wants to know if you can use deconvolution and PixInsight to give you similar outcomes. You can use deconvolution in PixInsight and it will make your stars smaller and bring out a little more detail. It will, in my experience, it will not do the same thing. I do use deconvolution, especially for uh, LRGB images to make the stars a little smaller and bring out a little detail. And I don't think the Chandrasekhar is referring, to, well, I don't know what he's referring to. Is he just talking about the stars or is he talking about the overall sharpening of the, of the contrast? in the, the details that you get Decon will velocity. actually do both. I mean, I personally use it to make my stars a little smaller, but it will also bring out a little bit of detail. But once again, you, you don't have the kind of control uh, that I'm used to having. I can't produce the same results in uh, Pix Insight that I can. Maybe in another 30 years of using Pix Insight? Uh, we should live that long. <laughs> I don't know. I, again, I use Pix Insight at, at least for fifty percent of my processing. I, I just find that I can get more finished results and fine adjustments with selections and with Pix Insight with all the tools that they have. Okay, uh, we have answered all the questions that are posted over here. So, if you have anything else you'd like to tell us about tonight, go for it. Should I uh, unshare my screen? Shall we go? You, you do, yeah, you do it. Eric, yeah. with your with your stamp uh, action, you can achieve a similar action by holding Shift Control Alt N E. Yes. This requires funky fingers. <laughs> I know. I just I convert it to an action. So I oh, okay, okay. Actually, sorry, sorry. I, I can have a keystroke. So yes. Ah, yes, yes. 
Okay. So you're right. I just call it a stamp because I don't know. Somehow I came up with that. I saw that name, so I just labeled that action a stamp. I actually have it as a keystroke, and so I can just have a single keystroke, and and that action will come up, and I'll and and I use that quite a bit because sometimes I'll take the stamp and go over and do something else with it. Uh, occasionally in Pix Insight, but there are some other tools that bring out a little more detail. Yes, I have nothing. Yes, I know there are, if you have like four fingers and <laughs> hold your breath and spin around twice and hit the keyboard, you can get it right. It's an interesting combination. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's why I converted it to an action. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're getting close to winding up for the night then, are we? Well, we don't have any more questions over there. Uh, nope, Tender Shakeguard did did uh, clarify. Uh, he was talking about overall sharpening, but um, yeah, that was addressed. So, okay, next week um, we're going to be back and we're going to hear all about Voyager, and uh, that'll be good. I want to thank Voyager the software, not the Voyager uh, the software. Not, yeah. not right, not not the spacecraft. Not the spacecraft. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> we're not um, trying to interrupt you, Alex. We're just no, I, Molly I, was I just clarifying. That's all. No, I need clarification now and then. Um, anyway, uh, so we'll be back next week, and we we will have Tim come back and tell us about the image containers, and we've got some other efforts that we're making to build some of these tutorials in. I want to thank Eric for stepping in. Uh, it's amazing how much stuff that guy knows and uh, how long he's been doing this, how he does it. Um, I mean, I, I, I will never compare with anything that I'm, I'm not that careful. I'm not that good. I just, I just don't spend my time on it like that. Boy, he does a great, uh, a great job on that stuff. Uh, all of you who uh, contributed your shots of the solar system to the Astro Imaging Channel, uh, for the tag shots, TAIC shots that we just did with Arno. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, as you know, um, we were, we have a separate YouTube link for just that particular film or for just that particular uh, thing. And then we it'll be, always be included as part of this show, which will be on YouTube forever and ever and ever and ever. And I think we've got everybody here. Um, yep, we got everything off the questions. So thank you. We will see you next week. And Molly, you're in charge. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks yep, for watching. You can head over to the to our YouTube channel to see just the the take shots slideshow. Share that with whomever you want. Watch it again. Enjoy the pretty music. And uh yep. Have a good night, all. <laughs>